Oh, we have a we have a question. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I I understand where you're uh, where you're coming from on on the uh, these issues of uh, student sensibility, social sensitivity to issues. But I, I really think that that reflects this unbelievable political correctness that has gripped every, as, every segment of, of American society. I wonder whether our panelists see that there is this overarching political correctness uh, um, which which puts a damper on um, student thought. Why, why does the, the academic world cave in to these, um, you know, to those who, whose feelings are so sensitive that everybody else must react and respond to their limitations? That's to the panel. I don't I think we are caving in. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I think the stories that were related were all about kind of going against that political yeah. correctness to, to pursue, um, you know, whatever it was we wanted to teach or, or let our students, um, you know, share, share with the, the group, so yeah. to speak. I, I would just say that, that on, in, in the story I just told, I insisted that the students not, uh, that, that they do post these rants, no matter what. And, and tell them that those particular individually, I say, look, this is the point of the exercise. If you're, you're going to have to take responsibility for offending people, uh, if that's so, so my, my pedagogically, I'm interested in getting them to think about what it takes to, to, to write uh, uh, satirical work and all that. But, but uh, there were moments where I could have said, yeah, you're right, that's kind of out there, you know, I'm afraid what's going to happen, but. Um, yeah. So I didn't anyway. I went to a panel this morning where um, Sheldon Hackney and Walter McDougall were talking about freedom, and this was um, for Franklin's birthday. And um, you know, at one point Hackney was saying there are 200 definitions of freedom, and how do you get at? Um, and he wasn't including Janis Joplin's, you know, freedom's another word for nothing left to lose. But then he he did say at one point he quoted the Oxford philosopher Isaiah Berlin, who said that um, freedom may be a very good thing for the wolves, but it's bad for the lambs. <laughs> and so, you know, there's sometimes, it's always this juggling between um, what freedom means, how much freedom you allow, or how much freedom, what are the lines? Mm -hmm. And that line is constantly shifting. And we're just ordinary human beings like all the rest of you, and we're trying to deal with this shifting of lines mm -hmm. as best we can. The, uh, the Rouse um, using of a disclaimer was very interesting because sometimes I, I, I have a disclaimer. I'm going to have to make a disclaimer on Wednesday in Art Since 1945, which is the large survey that I'm teaching because we're looking at the aftermath of World War II and we're going to look at a lot of the piles of dead bodies from the concentration camps and, um, and things which will be really upsetting to a lot of students. So telling them before the start of the lecture, letting them know that this may be difficult to look at and that if they want to sit on the aisle and if they want to leave, there will not be any repercussion other than the fact that they will miss this information, I think is something that I owe to them so that they won't be you know, unnecessarily and surprisingly um, upset. Yeah, not all the disclaimers we give in the university have to do with the hot button political correctness issues. So many of them do. But, but uh, your, your example made me remember that in my mental health ethics class, before we discuss um, suicide, I give a disclaimer. I know that some of you may have family and friends who committed suicide. If you think our discussion of the uh, DSM-4 criteria for, uh, you know, for, for depression is going to upset you, please don't come to class on Wednesday. Uh, I'm, you know, so, so I mean, there, there are ways to prepare students for hard conversations about decapitated aborted fetuses we're talking about, Roe versus Wade or Stenhart versus Carhartt or whatever. But, but I mean, there, there, are, there are ways to prepare your students that have to do with the hot button issues, but then some other issues are just sensitive topics. You know, not the hot button ones. Sure. We have Hi. a question over. Oh. <laughs> oh, I don't know who's got the microphone at this point. 
Okay. Um, <laughs> so this issue of political correctness and making these disclaimers, I think, um, is how to deal with things that everyone accepts as controversial or offensive or dangerous knowledge. Um, but are there ever instances where you take it upon yourselves to actively create a comfort zone and to make it so that the knowledge itself isn't, you know, offensive or, you know, you make it comfortable yourselves and that's an issue too because you don't want to be this arbiter of truth can, and say no I, this is yeah, so okay. yeah, I, I would, no that's real because I this is a really tiny point um, in this class when I often have TAs for it and and I tell them I had to do this one year I tell them not to get carried away when they're then they're maybe running a session and I told them because you know sometimes I've noticed they'll slip into using obscene language just in the course of talking because that's it's almost like that's okay because we're studying it. And, I, and so I, I actually, do, just along the, it's an interesting question because I do tell them that I think it's not decorous. I think you need to have a certain amount of decorum in the class. And I don't really know whether I'm doing it to make everyone feel comfortable. I just think it kind of, it, it, um, it doesn't preserve the separation between our reality and the subject as an object of study. Mm -hmm. The academic enterprise that I think ought to go, be, that's what the classes are for. Mm -hmm. And so there is, for me anyway, there's this distinction between that. We can, we can use whatever language we want privately, but there is a sort of a kind of a, a formality in my, in my view. So it's a int very interesting question. There's there also be a others. fundamental question of just uh, desensitization. There are things that um, emergency responders, physicians need to do that are very uncomfortable, but, but yeah. through exposure to these things, they become desensitized to things that were initially yeah. you know, quite shocking. So that can be used, in some cases has to be used, as part of pedagogical technique, that exposure to things that are deeply discomforting, but are necessary you know, to achieve a, a certain mm -hmm. kind of educational outcome. Yes, a question down in front here. I'm just wondering, what is exactly pornographic material, and what is art? Is there all um, acceptable uh, definition, the, the borderline, or is it the personal, uh, individual reaction that you have? Uh, for teaching, I think the comfort level is very important. But for I always felt I'm I'm really a hypocrite because you know I'm <laughs> afraid to teach <laughs> things beyond this. There are many different ways to define what art is, right? What can satisfy the the criteria right. of art? Um, you know whether it's an honorific definition or an institutional definition. You know an institutional definition like it's art because it's in a museum. Right, um, and it's art because those people who concern themselves in daily life with what art is, whether they be, if it's old enough, if it's a piece of material culture or visual culture that survived long enough and been preserved long enough, then it's worthy of our study. And now that we use these terms, material culture and visual culture, it's released a little bit of the pressure on the term art to encompass all of those things. Um, I think you know, for myself, with teaching things that have to do um, with, uh, that either contain a lot of nudity or sexual content, um, it, it's totally subjective for what I think is a really, um, a really strong image, something that has a lot to say um, beyond, uh, you know, these are two horny people coming at each other on a piece of canvas. Um, it has to be something that has um, uh, 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 real aesthetic content and um, real intellectual content to rise above something that's just kind of salacious imagery. And that is a, you know, that's a value judgment. And it's a judgment that, um, that I make out of you know, 20 years of experience um, in looking at things that have been given these honorific uh, definitions as being art, that have been given um, institutional um, uh, uh, you know, acceptance. Um, and it's something that really changes, I think, over time. Um, and, 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 and it's hard to make an argument for that. There, there's, 
There was a book um, that came out in the 1950s by the English uh, art historian Kenneth Clark called The Nude. And I remember reading it as an undergraduate. Um, and the thing I took away from Clark's definition of nude versus naked was nudes do not have pubic hair. Naked has pubic hair. Naked, not OK, right? Nude, OK. Because the nude you know, is idealized. The, the Dirtiness of the hair is removed, um, and then it's OK. And so sometimes I fall back on that, you know? If it's really kind of raw and hairy, then we, you know, then we leave it out. <laughs> well, the courts have struggled with trying to, to draw the line between pornography and obscenity and to allow the states to ban obscenity based on community values and standards of decency, but to allow porno mere pornography and also to allow for art. But, but it's sometimes very hard to explain or understand why you know, uh, the, 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 the nudity in o, o Calcutta or hair or Equus is OK, but some uh, uh, pole dancer you know, in Virginia is not OK. It, it's really hard to know exactly where we're drawing the lines. And, and I think, frankly, that these are often very, very local moral standards that are determining, uh, that, that are the values of the particular people making the decisions, the police, the court. That determines what's OK and not OK, what's obscene, pornographic. Uh, merely, merely artistic, and, and nothing else. It's, it's not as as fine as, as as not. So in the in the university context, I myself practice a certain amount of pragmatism. If I suspect it might cause a problem for me or for my students or for the uh, board of bar examiners, then I will I will pull back. If not, I will often go forward in order to educate my students as best I can. But in in professional schools, especially in the law school. Uh, I have to encourage my students to not do and say things on Facebook that might keep them from getting a job. And, and as much as it may be wonderful to take your class, I'm thinking here thinking, oh my god, my students can't take your class because if they did, when they were uh, applied for the bar or when they applied for a judicial clerkship, they might be discovered and oh my god, they might no, no. be deemed morally unfit yeah, for the practice of law. If they, don't, they don't have to friend, they, it, you could get on the site. In other, there's no connection to their name. It's just a place, it's a place, it's a fan page. It's called right. a fan. That's what you think. <laughs> well, no, they, none of them, almost none of them, you know, are LinkedIn or friends. But, or, but we do have but, law students who have lost jobs because of the content of their own Facebook pages. And I worry right. tremendously about, about personal websites and Facebook pages and so forth being, oh, the, being the source yeah. no, of, I, I mean, and not just the, pictures, but just words, just things you that, might say, yeah. as well as, you know, girls gone wild type pictures yeah. interfere with your capacity to enter a profession that you really deserve to enter. Yeah, right, right. I'll take a yeah. quick story, you know, since we have two chair, chairs of the Senate over here, a former chair of the Senate, a guy named Paul Bender, who was on presidential, he was an attorney on the presidential's, President's Commission on Obscenity. As he was leaving the room one day, one of the um, Congress people there said to him, Mr. Bender, I'm sure Sodom and Gomorrah had attorneys like you, you know? <laughs> hey. no. Woof. Uh, yes. Harvey. So I'm already getting uncomfortable. We have a, we have a microphone. So I'm going to change the subject to science if that's okay. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was just about to make that transition. So um, that. I'd like to ask both Martha and Gino um, the, the following question. We're talking about delivering knowledge and information to students. But what about when the student comes to you and, and makes a specific request? It's not uncommon for a student to come to me and say, tell me how to make anthrax even more pathogenic. You know, what, are the, what, are the, what are the genes that I need to put in? Right. So what if a student comes to you and says, you know, Dr. Farah, tell me what part of the brain I have to target to make a Manchurian candidate? Or Professor Segre, I'm really yeah. interested in making an atomic bomb at home with the, you know, baking soda and, 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 and grease. It, there must be some simple recipe. Where's your limit? What do you, what do you say to them? And then maybe, Anita, what's the, what, what can they legally say? So where, where is the limit when somebody comes to you and, yeah. and says, I want to know this? Well, I, I have to say, um, you know, I have it easy because my science is still so young that, uh, in fact, you know, we, we can't make Manchurian candidates, so I can, you know, plead ignorance for a while longer anyway. Um, but I, I'll tell you one type of question that I have repeatedly gotten. Um, you know, some of my work is on cognitive enhancement, um, both, uh, you know, sort of whether and how it works and who's using it and why, um, you know, 
normal healthy people, not people with neuropsychiatric illnesses, but normal healthy people taking often prescription medications to study longer, stay up for two days at a time, et cetera. And there are some medicines out there that can help you do that. Um, and, uh, you know, despite the fact that I think I'm delivering these, you know, probing lectures about the social, ethical, and legal implications, right, the questions are all, now how many milligrams of this should I take for, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, and, um, you know, I don't uh, give people advice on this, um, but, but sometimes I would like to, and I'll tell you, one reason I don't um, is that I have discovered trying to, trying to deliver nuanced information in most circumstances to most people is just hopeless. It's horrible. And one thing I have learned um, with my you know, short career as a neuroethicist, this is a new word now, um, you know, sort of uh, the ethics of neuroscience and how you use the fruits of neuroscience, is um, it, it's, it's incredible. Like sort of depending, you know, I, I do a, on the one hand, on the other hand kind of thing. And depending on which hand I mention first, you know, that's, that's what people take away. And this has happened to me in terms of, you know, press coverage and, and being, you know, held up as a, you know, drug pusher who, who, even though she says she doesn't have any financial relationship with the pharmaceutical industry, must, because look at the way she's pushing these drugs, you know, um, to, um, you know, uh, I think, misrepresenting my position as uh, never should a person take prescription medication for anything that's not an illness because they call it medication because it's medicine for sick people. I mean, that's not true. I, I think, see, I'm going to try to do it here, but I am afraid you're all going to misunderstand me. But, you know, look, there's cosmetic surgery. There's, there's all kinds of ways in which healthy, normal people try to make their lives a little better using medical interventions. I don't think a priori it's wrong to consider doing that with our brain function, our mental lives. Um, but I do think you got to proceed with extreme caution um, because, you know, that's a pretty complex little system. We don't entirely understand it. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, my answer to your question is uh, I, um, I, I do feel quite inhibited when people ask me those kinds of questions, and it's because as much as I would love to share with them my perspective on this, you know, kind of in my humble opinion, you know, here's, here's the way to proceed, um, I, I, I usually don't because uh, it's so easy to be misunderstood. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, Fortunately, physics is going through a relatively quiet phase right now. <laughs> nobody's asking about how to make, nobody's ever asked me how to make a better or a worse atom bomb. But one of the things I find is you have to keep clear that, um, that line between you know, yourself as a person and yourself as an expert. So when you're talking to a student, you might say, okay, uh, this is how you do this and this. But my values, I am also a person, and my values are you shouldn't do this kind of thing. And um, how you, you know, because it's a complicated relation, like any of these, like uh, client uh, attorney or like patient doctor. And student professor is also a complicated relation sometimes. And you have to make clear um, the parts of that in talking to students. Let's move beyond students and just talk about the the acquisition of knowledge more generally you know are there topics that are simply too dangerous um, uh, to pursue in your view um, if, if so what kinds of research would this describe well, there are certainly ones that are coming up in in biology very clearly now I mean there was a big you know, is a recombinant DNA. I mean, I'm not an expert on this. Sherry knows more, certainly. But, you know, on recombinant DNA in the early 70s, there was a question of whether this research should be pursued or not. Uh, stem cell, you know, all of these um, <clears throat> medical and biological things, and to a certain extent, things in all sciences, certainly. Um, you know, even as, you know, we talk about this disaster in Haiti, 
So they're saying we need to do better geophysics research. But can possibly some of this cause an earthquake? Can it stimulate an earthquake? It's a balancing. You want to know more, but what is the danger? You know, so it's do, always a risk, risk-benefit analysis. It's do, always what goes into these. Do kind we of as things. researchers assume the responsibility for the application of that knowledge, ah. or is that a, is that someone else's? Uh, in other words, if, if I pursue a basic research question, and I might imagine it could have. Um, I was just following orders. You mean, yeah, well, it, it's, it's a general question. We we, yeah. we have to and and it gets it gets to you know some of the reaction that Martha described to her research was predicated on on the danger that the knowledge would create in their view, and we might have our own understandings of potential danger. So when we have when we operate in that kind of environment, how does it affect our Mm -hmm. our, our willingness um, or our responsibility, in some cases, to assert the necessity to do this kind of research and build an apparatus that might protect that knowledge. Is another way of talking about forbidden knowledge, protecting the basic science from the negative applications. Well, I think just drawing the distinction that you just drew um, is is helpful and doesn't get done often enough. The distinction being between the knowledge that you might potentially gain by a certain research program and the actions that you then could take with that knowledge, you know, armed with that knowledge, if you were. Um, so, you know, if it's a matter of, um, you know, coming up with, uh, you know, new organisms that can be used for, you know, biological warfare or, you know, a simple, you know, do-it-yourself in your kitchen sink, you know, method for creating some virulent, uh, you know, pathogen, um, there, I think it's fairly, um, it's fairly clear what the risk is that it could be, you know, what, what the use would be. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there and it only takes one who has, you know, the goal of killing large numbers of people to, to do that. With a lot of the, um, the so-called forbidden knowledge, in the in the um, in the human sciences, um, sort of the social science, biological science kind of interface, um, I think the the worry about applications um, is is often quite misplaced. I mean, you know, the idea that okay, what if we find out that the brains of people who grow up poor are different? In fact, what if we just, you know in plain talk, let's just make a value judgment. Like, they don't develop as well, right? I mean, in some sense, that must be true, right? They're, they're getting lower IQs, and that's not a fact about kidney development. It's a fact about brain development. Um, so what, what then would the actions be that we're afraid of? You know, what, what action would be taken based on that knowledge? Well, I think some people assume that um, if a difference is biological, then it's immutable. There's no point in trying to change it, no point in trying to make it better for the people who are affected. But that's just a non sequitur. I mean, just because a difference is biological doesn't mean you can't change it, right? Every time we learn something, our brain is changing. Um, but, but, but Martha, people might just to jump in and say, but what does an IQ test mean, you know? So, well, yeah, I mean, that's the whole other area in terms of forbidden knowledge. There's been a lot of terrible, you know, bad research, um, good research that people have felt, you know, shouldn't be pursued, uh, a lot of uh, misunderstandings and, and, and uh, misuse of that research. But sorry, I, I No, that's just what I was saying. I mean, that is an argument, you know, and what it... Well, you know, so, I mean, there's, you know, research on IQ actually has very much, suffers from a lot of the same problems as research on, um, uh, you know, brain differences or whatever, particularly um, when it gets linked up to biological measures. So, you know, you all remember the book, The Bell Curve, which, um, how many years ago was that now? 15, 20, something like that? Um, which you know made the case that differences in IQ were largely genetic. Okay, well you know it's an empirical question. Maybe they are genetic. Maybe they're not. 
In fact, most of the research that that book was based on is flawed research. I mean, we, you know, the, again, the, the science, it has a kind of nicely self-correcting uh, quality if it's allowed to proceed. Um, you know, in the years since that book was published, more research has been done. People have understood the systems better, and they realize that, you know, the twin studies, the adoption studies, and so forth that were done greatly underestimated the environmental um, influences on IQ. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is, people thought that, okay, if, you know, if IQ is genetic, then, and this is like an inference, which I think really shouldn't be made, but then what's the point in offering um, you know, good quality child care and preschool education to poor children because um, their low IQs are caused by genetics? Well, that doesn't follow at all, right? I mean, first of all, we know that their IQs aren't largely determined by genetics, okay? Um, very rough rule of thumb. In the world at large, it's maybe 50%. In fact, in lower SES communities, lower, lower SES populations, the um, proportion of IQ that's heritable is uh, approaching zero. Very interesting. Um, but second of all, even if it were true, I mean, imagine a possible world. It's not the world we live in, but imagine a possible world where you know, poor kids have low IQs, and it's totally based on their inferior genes that they inherited from their poor parents. Now, the question is, do we want to offer them good quality early education? Well, sure, why not? I mean, it's, there's just... Could it be cheaper to weed them out? Eugenics, well, you, you can't, know? What, ah, but that's, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, that, that's, a, that's a different question, right? Do we want to stop them from um, having families? Three or, generations of imbeciles are enough. enough. <laughs> right, 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 right. But that's another question. Do we want to, I mean, it's, let's ask the question. Do, do we want to do that? If it turns out that some families, you know, like this one that you're quoting, you know, just have genes that cause them to be failures and criminals and whatever, do we want to stop them from having children? That's a question you can ask, and you can answer it either way. You can say, no, I don't believe that a good social policy is to stop people from having kids, even if their kids are more likely than average to be screwed up kids, right? I mean, your, your, your decision about what to do, given the knowledge that these kids have genes that predispose them to bad outcomes, your, your decision about what to do is not logically constrained by what the research says. If only the world were logic. I mean, if we could kind of control yeah. the use and interpretation of information, we wouldn't have a problem. The problem is the bare fact hanging out there, poor people are not as smart as rich people, that's a dangerous fact. And the fact that we know, to a moral certainty, it's going to be used against the very people that you might want to help. Others don't want to help those people. Well, no, I think that's true. And I think it gets back to my you know, earlier lament about any kind of nuance at all, like totally gets lost in the scuffle when these things, when these ideas are discussed in any kind of public way. Well, it, it gets to the question, you use the word misuse, and this is a, a nice generic phrase to use. I think we might posit that those of us who conduct research, whether it's uh, you know, basic physics, biological research, social behavioral research, we don't have in mind nefarious uses of that research at the front end. We, we would like to think that we're applying it to good rather than ill purposes. But we might, given certain kinds of research, uh, anticipate that it could be used to, to produce cheap weapons that might, if they fall into the hands of terrorists, do damage. Now, the, the question is, do we have an obligation? Two questions. One is, do we have a generic obligation as researchers to anticipate potential misuse of our, of the knowledge we generate and be proactive about managing that. In other words, if we feel that we're doing work that's easily misinterpreted, does that simply raise, elevate our, the responsibility that rests with us to talk incessantly about it, to make sure that the proper interpretations, at least those interpretations we think are reasonable, are made? Or if we anticipate that this science, if it falls into the wrong hands, could do real damage, do we as researchers have an obligation 
to make sure that that happens. Is that an obligation that falls to other people? It's, uh, I, I pose that, that question. It's for you communications guys. You have to figure it out. <laughs> well, there's a couple of people who want yes. to weigh in here. Well, I would just suggest that um, in academia, we have a different job from politicians. Politicians try very hard not to give nuanced answers unless they're dodging the question, in which case they give as nuanced an answer <laughs> as they can. But, you know, if you're a politician, usually you're pushing a particular agenda, and so you make it very clear it's black or it's white, and that's their job. They're trying to push a particular direction. I mean, I would actually ask the panel, should academics try to do that, so we've figured out what's right, and so I'm going to present things in a way that makes it clear for that, or should they say, I'm going to give the thing in the full nuance as well as I can and let the public sort it out, and hopefully over time they will. That in global warming, for example, that issue has come up, is, is that community being perhaps a little bit too black and white, mm -hmm. covering up the nuances because they're afraid the public will get the wrong message. Good question. Do you want to take more? Or, no, let's, let's talk about that. You know, I, I was just thinking about um, Hitler. And, um, and in the 1930s, uh, there was an exhibition that was mounted by the Nazis called um, Entartete Kunst, Degenerate Art, um, in which uh, numerous examples of modern art from the first half or the first third of the 20th century were gathered up and displayed for the German people to see what what types of images came from degenerate minds, came from Jewish minds, came from foreign minds, came from these minds that should have been, you know, and, and would soon be, you know, attemptively eradicated. Um, the exhibition was a huge hit, right? You know, lots of people went through and saw it. And, and at the same time, there was an exhibition of, of good German art and art that came from uh, you know, strong minds, minds that were good with the fatherland. Um, and it ran for several years um, as well. And Hitler had a huge interest in art as a kind of, as a, as a social force, as a sociological force, because he was an artist. Um, and he produced these kind of generic watercolor landscapes and stuff. Has anybody ever seen a, a painting by a picture by Hitler? Just a, just a few people, yeah? Um, that's largely because they are, they are verboten now. They are really forbidden. And the images that we have that are by Hitler, the United States government owns a, a large number of them, hmm. but they won't let them go on display. They won't let them tour because there's a big fear that people who have these you know, very dangerous political agendas and identify with the Nazis will glom onto these images and will venerate them and will treat them in a way that, you know, in a cultish way that is very, you know, um, that is kind of seditious and scary and, um, and, and, and may press upon the, the, the social ideologies that we hold dear in this moment. So. One of the difficulties of responding to, the, um, to your, your comment for me is uh, that there's so many different roles that I play, that many academics play, if we could only sit in the university in our ivory tower and do our thing, it might be possible to separate ourselves from the politics. And, but if you're a professor and a lawyer and a consultant and you're on C-SPAN and CNN and you, know, you, have, you have a public, a public uh, persona as well, how do any of us, when we leave you know, the ivory tower, which many of us now do, and our university wants us to do, right? the, the president's office wants us to be out there in the media, once you leave the, the, the lab and the classroom and the office, then you have to take into account the political implications of what you're going to say. I think it's a sort of a moral duty and a political obligation. Even if you could separate yourself from those obligations in the ivory tower, you cannot, I think, once the, the, the camera is on your face. Uh, we have a question here and then a, a question over there. Great questions, by the way. Keep yes. them coming. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question about peer review. It seems that peer review is working in the sciences and maybe in the arts and in law from the point of view of the knowledge side. But is peer review actually working on the value side in terms of establishing criteria? It's conventional that certain things are acceptable and therefore that's another peer sort of thing. I'd like to, to think a little bit with you about how you see peer review in the academic community in a secular school as opposed to a non-secular school. 
how is peer review working for the academic community and how does it deal a little bit with the issue of values? Great question. Well, I, I'll respond to that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, in, in the sciences, um, maybe the, the value question comes up most often in peer review in terms of um, is this an important or worthwhile research topic? Um, a lot of, you know, basically when you submit a proposal to NIH or NSF, you know, they're, they're looking to see, you know, do you have the right control groups, you know, do you have a big enough sample, that kind of stuff. But they're also, hopefully, asking the question, is it even worth getting this size sample and those control groups together to do this research? I mean, you know, why should we care about this topic? So I think that that is a kind of a values question. And um, my experience, you know, well, basically, peer review is the worst possible system, except for all the others, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so um, it's, it's got a million problems with it. Don't get me started. But, um, but let me say this. I think certainly in the sciences, and I'm guessing in the arts as well, um, there's kind of, um, there is a variety of, of different mechanisms through which people get funded, and the vast majority of ways you get money are submitting applications which undergo peer review. Um, but there are also these kind of oddball methods of, you know, you um, suck up to some uh, foundation person, <laughs> you know, and they just write you the check. Um, or, uh, you know, certainly some of the military um, uh, funding agencies, and the military actually funds a lot of science in this country. Um, some have peer review, some don't. Um, my Navy research on the effects of stimulants on cognition is funded by, um, uh, you know, funded by the Navy and basically, you know, Dr. Perez, as long as he's happy with the research I'm doing, you know, the money keeps coming. Um, and I think, I think that's important because as, as much as I sort of hate the idea of you know, individual people making these judgment calls and the possibility of, of sucking up to them, as I jokingly said, um, or, you know, sort of politics, connections, all that kind of stuff. I actually think it has a good effect on the, um, the sort of ecosystem of research funding as a whole to have more than one kind of mechanism. So when you have the peer review, the good side about it is that it is, in a sense, very fair. Um, the bad side is that it's very conservative. You know, basically, yeah. the, f the things that get funded are the things that don't have anything wrong with them. They're not necessarily the things that have anything really right and exciting about them. On the other hand, you know, these guys like Dr. Perez, who sits at his desk and reads proposals and says, oh, I like that one, I'm going to fund that, right? There is a kind of lack of deliberation, fairness, you know, it hasn't gone past, you know, many pairs of eyes. but he is able to, in a very kind of nimble way, say, oh, you know what? For the last six months, there's been really cool stuff happening in this area. I'm going to quickly get some labs working on it. Um, so basically, I think you know, the, the question of values in terms of what should we even be looking at um, is, is well served by a combination of peer review and these alternative methods. That peer review can have a bit of a stifling kind of fuddy-duddy conservative um, influence. I'll just weigh in for 30 seconds. I think, I mean, there are two separate issues, peer review in publication and peer review in funding. Peer review in publication by the, is almost a settled issue because everybody puts everything online right away. So it gets published later, but there isn't a peer review that way. In funding, sure, there are, you know, this fuddy-duddy part. But on the other hand, you know, I've seen other systems in which there's a fair amount of research, such as in the former Soviet Union or in China, where you don't have that kind of system of peer review, and then it gets subject to all forms of corruption and so on. So peer review is certainly, it's the best of all the methods, but, you know, one has to have a constant effort to have um, innovative and new and different kinds of research. And this is something that a lot of people worry about now. And, um, you know, keeps trying to be dealt with. And certainly universities, by providing seed funding, 
in yeah. advance of the effort to obtain funding from some of these other sources clearly have in mind, I think, the goal of innovating in that respect. That is to let the faculty themselves, with respect to their own science or art or scholarship, determine what they think uh, is useful. So at least it, it gives them an opportunity to, to, to get started, whether it, whether it takes hold, whether it takes root, and eventually obtains that funding is, a, is certainly a different kind of question. Uh, we had a question over here, yes. Um, so I wanted to go back to something that was a distinction that was made between the politician uh, who always gives a simple answer, um, and speaking as a political scientist uh, and somewhat politician, um, it's not always a simple <laughs> answer. Um, and uh, and then this notion that that we can sort of you know the truth of things is always sort of complex and nuanced and and so on and so. And, and we have this notion as well that because you know so much university research is dependent upon the government and so much of that is dependent upon popular appeal and because it is seen that the way to communicate to masses is to oversimplify or, or to, to sort of boil things down to something where it's like, this is about children. Children are good. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that what you should do is you should, you know, the president should go out and say, what is your research about? It's about children and, make, and, and good children. It's like, oh, great. So, but my, my question is, is that given that um, a, a somewhat polemical argument can be made that public discourse has gotten uh, increasingly, let's use a, a sort of non-polemic word, simplified uh, and, and, and essentialized, would you say that there is some sort of, um, even, even if it would cost research dollars or cost popular approval, um, there is some, some sort of mandate on uh, members of the academy in particular to sort of stand against this tide of sort of relentless simplification uh, in the pursuit of sort of political objectives and say, no, 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 we're, I'm, you know, I'm not going to take my 30 seconds spiel on Fox News. I'm going to actually explain it in detail and, and you know, come whatever political consequences may. Yeah, no, go, go well, uh, it, it, it's, it's dangerous and, and it's not easy to do. And, and I think that what happens often I mean, I'm really sympathetic to this, but what often happens is, is the academy gets, it, it gets further ridiculed, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, for, uh, the, the, so the, the att these attempts that you see to try to get out there and speak as simply as possible, not necessarily patronizingly, but simply, um, because we ought to be able to explain what we do relatively simply, but, but um, the more nuance you get into, the more people will roll their eyes, and you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's there's a big, real big divide between the especially academy. about things that people feel really passionately about yeah. and, and personally about. Um, and a, a number of years, I was asked to give a, a talk at Gettysburg College um, about an artist who I'd written about named John Sims, who is an African American artist from Florida who recolors the Confederate battle flags of, of mm. various sorts and, um, and has made them red, black, and green, the African national colors. And um, he had one that he used the citrus colors, and he called it the Florida Confederate flag and different things. And he was giving an exhibition at Gettysburg College, and they asked me to come and speak. And the Klan boycotted mm. my talk. And planted people in the audience, these Ku Klux Klan members in the audience, to harass me. And here I was coming out of the ivory tower <laughs> you know, right. to come and give this talk in a smaller ivory tower. Um, and all of a sudden was confronted by these people who, feel, who felt really passionately about a symbol that they saw as being part of their heritage and as a positive thing and as a kind of white pride thing. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and I was there to, you know, to be publicly humiliated and eviscerated for my support for this artist, even though I really had just written a very neutral kind of, this is what this artist does and it's provocative. You know, I wasn't in my mind supporting his program, but because I had written something, it supported his program because it, it lent my name and my institutional affiliation and my credibility to what he had done. Um, and, and, and some of these, uh, these, uh, these white supremacists asked these questions in the, um, uh, in, in the audience, and I felt I handled them pretty well. And then later I looked online at their website, and they claimed to Oops. have torn me up, you know, yeah. and, to, and, and to have humiliated me, and that, you know, I, I purposely had not called on them because I saw the Confederate flag emblems on oh. their shirts, and I couldn't see that far into the audience, you know? Uh -huh. And so it was really twisted, right? Um, it, you know, in these different ways. And I, I was so scared, you know, in, in yeah. I, I didn't stay in Gettysburg that night, I stayed in Baltimore, 
Hmm. You know, I said, you can't, you can't put me up in a hotel in Gettysburg because like there are two hotels there or something. Like they'd know where I was. You know? yeah. and there are some political um, truths which are very simplistic. Discrimination on the basis of race is wrong. Uh, but there's also some subtle things, like whether stem cell research is ethical or not. So, so that I think that we do sometimes have an opportunity as academics to make strong, unambiguous, sound bitey statements to the media and feel great about it. But other times, we will be compromising our own values if we dumb down our perspective in order to get our five seconds on Fox News. And uh, let me just say, I mean, I think um, that, you know, we, academics in the ivory tower, um, you know, there, we have room for improvement in our ability to simply and clearly communicate. Um, but, you know, even if we do the best that could be done with the information that we're trying to get across with all that nuance, um, we're, we're also dealing with limitations in the media. I mean, you know, Fox News or, you know, even NPR, I mean, there's, there's a limit to how long they're going to give you to explain things. And then taking it one step further, the public has, you know, a certain limited attention span and, you know, why should they be all that interested in the intricacies of my fascinating research? Well, of course I think they should, but, um, but um, also the, the public's um, education, um, particularly in science because, you know, um, the, well, even in the arts too, you'd be surprised. Yeah, because whenever well, you get actually, into the yeah. realm of aesthetics, uh, you have the same problem. Yeah. Try to explain Mapplethorpe. Uh, from an art historical perspective, and the eyes will roll and they'll say it's irrelevant. You know, that, that so, sorry, I did, sorry. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, just, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, now that you said that, I, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, so I'm really, I mean, there's, there's, there's problems with your, you know, lovely idea of stepping up and, you know, just uh, getting that job of communicating done. You know, we could probably do better, but in addition, you know, the, the sort of forums, the fora, where we would do it, um, impose their limitations. And then the, the people who are receiving the information have limitations, partly of a societal, you know, cause, namely the limited education. I, I might say as well that uh, perhaps one thing we should be strong advocates of, not so much being on one side of a particular uh, scientific dispute or political dispute or another, but the value of, of skepticism and research yeah. is something that we as an institution of higher learning are absolutely invested in. And uh, there are opportunities to, to stress the value of, of that. And in a sense, that is advocating for a complex approach to a problem. Uh, but it is a very difficult message to, uh, uh, to deliver. It's, it, it's one that I think higher education uh, could do a more effective job of, of, of uh, promoting. Uh, through our faculty and through the re research that we're doing, uh, and and it, but it is a difficult it is a difficult claim to make because people want answers, and in the context of a policy dispute, they're typically demanding answers or at least best guesses, if not answers, and it's difficult to come through and say there is no clear answer, or we can take some guesses, but they're not particularly good guesses at the moment. It's it's it, it puts a researcher in a very difficult. Vince, can I just say just so we don't just so we don't keep kind of creating this kind of rift between you know, the people and the academia. I, I notice in my own students, I spend a whole semester trying to be nuanced. And then you have the final exam comes, and you have them writing essays. And all of a sudden, you're seeing exactly what you, not always, <laughs> but sometimes you don't. But very often, more often than you'd like, I think, what about that day I spent 45 minutes on the nuance of this problem? And here I get black and white. And so it's 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 a that may be a you know educational process and part of the part of you know a, a, a function of youth and all of that inexperience, but it's it's not necessarily just I mean they've been exposed to the academy the whole semester. So anyway, and we have a question over over here. Yeah, a question about intellectual property. Um, so now um, we have electronic readers for books which are becoming more popular. And um, these readers come with some things which normal books might not come with, like license agreements and fair use. So maybe I could lend a physical book to my friend so he can read it. And, but um, if I were to do the equivalent with my electronic copy, I could be breaking the law. 
Um, so with these like new innovations, is um, knowledge becoming more forbidden behind kind of legal barriers? Well, with the Nook, you can lend it for like two weeks, right? With the, right? with the Barnes and Noble Nook. This is one of the, the ways that they're trying to invade the Kindle's uh, market is that with the Kindle, you can't lend to somebody else's electronic device. But with the Nook, you can for two whole weeks. Mm -hmm. And then it you know, zaps back to you. Or have I, as I've discovered within my own family, if all the Kindles are linked to a common account, they can all share them. So someone, some sugar daddy out there just has to say, <laughs> everybody use my account. Uh, but it is, it's an interesting question. The, 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 the question about the walls, not that we construct, but that the commercial world constructs around intellectual property. And to the extent that we behave as commercial entities with corporate interests, uh, we also defend rights to intellectual property. That is walling off knowledge. There's no question about it. It's a great it. way to understand trade, trade secrets and uh, copyright and patents and so forth as creating a proprietary uh, sort of forbidden knowledge and then you have to buy your way into access and buy your way into the right to share and it's it's not so clear to what extent we should have to be buying our way <laughs> into into access to uh, to valuable information. It's a great great point. Yeah. Um, the um, the uh, um, the problem is, is, is less interesting when, when I can't share my copy of Hamlet on my Kindle with you, because we can all get a copy of Shakespeare's Hamlet somewhere else. But when it's more exclusive, less, less readily available information, it becomes a serious problem. Obscure artists, for example, whose music is only available in these obscure forms, that's more of a problem when the access is limited due to, due to the, uh, these sort of proprietary understandings of, of, uh, of, of, of control over art. And we don't have time to go into it now, but uh, a group of faculty are considering questions surrounding open access uh, in the research domain, driven largely by the behavior of publishers who purchase, essentially they take the rights to research publications and then sell them back to the universities that produce that knowledge. Um, those universities being funded by the federal government that ultimately, mm -hmm. that funded the research that allowed the professor at that university to produce that knowledge. And so the NIH and other organizations have been demanding uh, publication uh, practices that generate more open access to that research. So there are, there are um, complications surrounding the circulation of knowledge that are well understood, uh, but which we have not resolved at this point. There, there are a lot of open questions to uh, how we create uh, an, a system that provides adequate access to information, even when large numbers of people recognize that the system has some real defects to it. And how many of us let our lectures be freely taped by our students and turned into podcasts or turned into proprietary? I don't know. I mean, I think I know a lot of my colleagues in the law school are extremely loath to have their students uh, 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 take control over recordings of their classes. Uh, and just put them out there. But yet I think this point that you just made is one that applies to us as well. We may be doing things to limit access to, to our, for our, we may be making our, our learning forbidden knowledge and should we be instead making it more available through podcasts and webcasts and recordings and so forth. Right. Interesting. Now there are fan fantastic questions. These are terrific questions. Uh, this is being videotaped and for a fee, <laughs> you'll have, no, I can not. Uh, <laughs> But, I, but we are running short on, on time. I wanted to do a couple of things. First is to thank you for being here and to thank you for your questions. Uh, secondly, to uh, invite you to continue talking with, with our panelists. We have a, a wonderful reception. Uh, and this topic being forbidden knowledge, I'm certain there are things that they're willing to tell you <laughs> secretly that they would not have said uh, publicly here. Um, but I do want to thank you again and especially thank our panelists for this wonderful discussion. Uh, Please join me. And, and at this point, I'd like to turn things over to uh, Sherry Adam, the past chair of the Faculty Senate. So um, it's my privilege to conclude this symposium by acknowledging all the individuals who've made it possible. And first, I'm sure you'll all agree that this has been quite an extraordinary discussion. Um, Conversation among faculty members seems very simple, but it actually takes a lot of effort and a great deal of organization 
to make it happen. So I would also personally like to thank the faculty panelists, um, Gino, Gwendolyn, Ralph, Martha, and Anita for um, taking part in this discussion. And I want to mention one other individual. Ruth Schwartz Cowan is a science historian who is supposed to be on this panel. She was involved in the planning of this. She was involved in the initial discussions. And because of personal matters, she couldn't be here today. But again, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for a great discussion. And I'd like to thank our terrific moderator, Vince Price. Uh, his background in communication made him ideally suited for this, uh, his role in this discussion. Now, there have been several other people who have been instrumental in planning this. First of all, Harvey Rubin and Bob Hornick, uh, the chair and chair-elect of the Senate. Leo Charney from the Provost's Office. Steve Steinberg from the President's Office. Janelle Haynes, the graduate assistant for the Senate and the School of Nursing, and I see Afaf Malish, the dean of the nursing school at the back. Uh, they've provided us for the last three years a wonderful venue, and the staff here at the nursing school has really been fantastic in helping us organize this event. And last but not least, Sue White, the executive assistant of the Senate. And without Sue, as many of you know, none of this would actually ever happen. Uh, Sue, please stand up. And finally, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for the um, lively discussion. And please join us just outside for the reception. Thank you all very much. <laughs>